Just good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Rebecca Pallett. Um, I'm a partner in the employment team, and I'm joined by my colleague, Pilly, um, who's also in the employment team. Um, this morning, we're going to um, do a, a seminar in our what we call People Matters series, um, and we're going to cover some tips for avoiding tribunal claims and how you can put your organisation in, in the best position. Um, if you've got any questions, um, then by all means, put them in the chat as we, we go along. Um, and if we get time, we'll answer them at the end. This is a, a 30 minute session, which is intended to give you some quick tips. Um, but if you'd like more information, um, as I say, put, put a question in the chat and we'll do our best to answer it. Or you're very welcome to get in touch with us um, once, once we've finished. OK, so in terms of what we're going to cover this morning, we're going to have um, a quick look at the, the current landscape. So how the ET system is, is working at the moment and how that might impact on, on you. Um, we're going to have a look at some common stumbling blocks, things that trip up um, employers and commonly result in employment tribunal claims. Um, we're then going to take you through some practical tips for avoiding those, those stumbling blocks um, and look look at some options for resolution. So how can you resolve um, workplace issues perhaps before they get to the to the ET stage or indeed once once the claim's been issued, how do you um, how might you try and resolve it without going to a hearing? Um, and then finally, just a couple of tips. If if we you do end up in a position where you've you've got a claim against you, then how do you prepare for that litigation? How do you put the, the organization in the in the best position to be able to deal with with that? claim. Okay, so if we have a very quick look at the at the tribunal landscape. Um, so if obviously if you do have to defend a, a claim, it's going to be heard by by the employment tribunal. Um, it might come as a shock to you, but at any one time there are about 100,000 employment tribunal claims in the system. Um, the average waiting time, so from the point at which you issue a claim to, to a hearing is currently 49 weeks. So that's that's nearly a year. Um, so obviously it can be a really protracted affair, which takes a lot of time and a lot of resource. So is is something um, that, that you really do want to avoid if, if you can. And I've put a couple of the stats on, on that um, slide um, and you'll see that um, the, the tribunal is perhaps um, groaning at the seams at the moment. So there's a there's a backlog of 37,000 claims. Um, and we're certainly seeing that in our our day to day practice. So I've got a couple of claims actually that have taken nearly two and a half, three years to, to get to a hearing. Um, so you really don't don't want to um, have that kind of protracted affair if you can if you can avoid it. So what what's resulted in in those um, issues and, and how does that affect you? Well, the, the abolition of the fees um, meant that claims skyrocketed. Um, the COVID pandemic has resulted in a huge number of claims. Things perhaps went quiet while it was happening, but now we've seen a massive increase um, in in claims about how the employers how employers handled it um, so all of the problems that I've, I've put on there which are quite self-explanatory I think all of those things mean that the tribunal is is as I say groaning at the seams but it also means that it's it's pushing employers to deal with things differently um, so pushing um, mediation so very often it's possible to get um, a hearing for mediation or dispute resolution um, way before a hearing. Um, so if if the if a claim is issued, you, you'd have the chance to resolve it without going to to a hearing. Um, so that that's that's the kind of landscape that, that we're operating in. And I wanted to to take you through that as a kind of way of saying you really you really want to avoid avoid that. Um, so what are the what are the kind of typical stumbling blocks that that we see um, and that trip employers up and result in employment tribunal claims? I don't know if anybody um, wants to put any ideas in the chat. I don't know what um, if if anybody um, has has any ideas of typical things that that tend to to trip employers up. Have we got got any ideas? 
well put put a few in there as I'm as I'm talking um so I mean commonly the the ones that we see um are delay in in raising in in management raising concerns with the employee so you end up in a position where problems are allowed to persist for a really long time without being dealt with um, and that can cause all sorts of problems you know particularly if it's a relationship issue um, and and those relationships are, are allowed to fester it can really really cause problems um, give you a give you a, a real life example I've got a case at the moment of a lady who's brought a claim on the basis that the terms of her contract weren't clear so she's a trade union representative and it wasn't clear what time she was entitled to take for her trade union activities and the employer unfortunately let it go on for a really long time let that lack of clarity go on didn't manage it properly and so on and we're now in a position where she can probably establish because she was given a huge amount of flexibility that she's now entitled to that flexibility when otherwise she wouldn't have so um, delay in, in raising things can cause real problems um, another thing we see frequently is failure to follow policies properly and consistently um, and, and a lack of consistency um, can, can result in um, or, or failure to follow a policy. You might think, well, that, that might well result in a, in a breach of contract claim but, or even unfair dismissal, but it, but it can be a lot wider than that and it, and it can open you up to um, risks in terms of, of discrimination. So if, if you're in a position where you've treated somebody differently, not consistently, um, then, then you might have to justify that to the tribunal. And if you can't say why you did it, then, then the tribunal's obliged to find that there was discrimination. So that can, that can cause real problems. Um, not investigating complaints properly or in a, in a timely manner. Um, so that obviously can lead to unfairness, again, lack of consistency and so on, which might be a, a discrimination claim. An employee might say, you know, the reason you didn't investigate this was because of my age or my sex or, or whatever it, it might be. I think from an employee relations perspective, it also causes problems. So um, it, it leads to an employee's sense of, of not feeling that they're being listened to um, and, and a, a sense of disgruntlement, I think. And, and that puts them in a position where they're more likely to bring a, a claim against the charity. Um, we often see a lack of, of documentation um, surrounding a claim, so things that haven't um, been recorded. And in my notes here, I've written record, record, record. Um, so even if it's a, even if it's an informal meeting or a conversation with with an individual, we would always say make sure that you've got a note of that. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, um, but but notes of conversations are are really important. And sometimes we get pushback and and people say. Well, it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a, a formal conversation. So why should we record it? Um, but but even if it's informal, you ought you ought really to be doing that. Even if it's just a kind of management conversation. Um, and then we've got particular issues that arise um, when dealing with employees with with protected characteristics, um, because. And I think there is a perception sometimes that that, that requires um, employers to treat everybody in exactly the same way. And actually, um, discrimination law goes a bit further than that. And there are there are certain aspects of it. So let, let, particularly, for instance, we see a lot of claims um, in respect of disability discrimination and, and reasonable adjustments where there's a, an obligation you know, to, to go a bit further than, than treating everybody the same and to make adjustments for, for those individuals. So, so they're some of the things that, that might trip you up that might cause an employee to, to bring a claim. And um, Pilly's now going to talk you through how you can avoid some of those stumbling blocks. Good morning, everyone. Um, so one of the first things that I'm going to talk you through is about raising concerns with employees promptly. Um, and what, that can be whether it's misconduct or performance, for example. Um, where concerns aren't raised promptly, it can cause an issue. And I'm going to go through some examples of how it causes an issue. So one example um, is where that lack of early intervention jeopardises the fairness of any subsequent dismissal. 
Um, and there can be a tendency to let matters just run on with the hope that they might resolve themselves. You know, managers put those issues into the too difficult pile. Um, and that's really not uncommon. Um, and what can then happen is the matter runs on. Um, the organisation then gets to a stage where the relationship within that team is just broken down to the extent that no one's speaking, for example. Um, and they're left at a stage where they're really considering dismissal. Um, and that's when you as HR can then get a call um, where the managers say, right, what I want to do is dismiss. But you're going to have to push back on that and say, well, you haven't actually followed the process. So that's why that early intervention is key to at least start that process if you're then looking potentially at a situation where you're going to dismiss. And um, of course, in that kind of scenario, you're going to impact on the team's ability to function. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to see that kind of situation and also multiple grievances coming out of that, all that could have been uh, avoided. Um, and something that Becky's touched upon as well is that lack of consistency in approach. Um, and one scenario where we do see this lack of consistency um, is where there's been issues with, it, with an individual, whether that be misconduct or performance, and I'm just giving those as examples. Um, and then they're not managed by that manager because they're just not a manager who wants to proactively manage that, those concerns. And then they leave and another manager comes in who, who is willing to, to deal with the issue. And that lack of consistency with an approach to performance or misconduct can cause a real issue then when that new manager takes over with that employee thinking, well, why, why are you raising these concerns now? My behaviour hasn't changed for the past X amount of months and, and you're raising those now. And it can make it more difficult to deal with those issues. So um, to avoid this, as it states on the slide, you've got to nip problems in the bud before they start to escalate. And so that we've actually started a process. Not all processes are going to end up in dismissal. But if you want to be in the best position to defend that kind of claim, you need to have started a process. Um, and as we've set out on the slide, there's some examples there of um, how to deal with some less serious issues. So that quiet word, often really helpful. Um, as Becky's alluded to, it's helpful to maybe make a note of that if it is a management issue, a management instruction, um, verbal informal warning, letter of concern, perhaps just sort of making it noted that there are some issues um, that will need to be resolved. Um, mediation can often be really helpful, even at an informal stage. That doesn't have to be mediation with a capital M. It can just be talking to a number of individuals as well, just to avoid those team relationships becoming fractious and, again, stopping the issue escalating. And also coaching um, and training can also be really helpful for managers to deal with these kind of issues. So also remember... As Becky's mentioned, I just really want to hammer it home. Please do record informal action as well. It's really, really important. Um, but also that goes with that is it's really important to let the individual know that a formal process will follow if the informal action hasn't been dealt with. Um, just to make sure that they're aware of what might happen. One, that might help them um, you know, pull the bootstraps up and actually sort of you know, deal with the issue that's been raised with them. But also it means that um, even the manager knows then that if this issue isn't going to be resolved at the informal stage, we're going to be able to move into another stage and deal with it. And I think managers sometimes need that roadmap to know there is another stage if this issue, which is causing them problems, is not dealt with. So we have, oh, I'm sorry, I've just, I knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I've skipped forwards, sorry. Okay, ACAS guidance. So we've just put on that slide there, um, the uh, link to the ACAS guidance. And if you just type ACAS guide to challenging conversations into Google, you should find that already. Um, this is a really good guide from ACAS. It's an older guide, but it's absolutely fine and it's up to date. Um, and if you've got managers which are struggling to have those tricky conversations, then it's definitely worth them reading that and being empowered to be able to have those conversations. Always helpful to know how, you know, to empower someone to face the problem, always helpful. Help them prepare, really important if you're having a conversation with an individual, just to get your thoughts, uh, you know, in a row in terms of how you're going to deal with it. But importantly for the manager, not to go, <laughs> Um, awry and beyond what the plan is for that conversation as well and also as we stated on the slide when not to, to carry on that conversation when to stop talking is almost as important as when to speak 
So the next issue of sort of practical consideration for you is about following policies properly and consistently. So policies should um, reflect the legal framework and also ensure a really fair process. It's definitely worth making sure policies are reviewed and with some regularity to make sure that they are up to date. They shouldn't be something that's gathering dust. They should be something that's used all the time. Um, and for the most part, particularly if they're well drafted, policies are going to be your friend. Um, they should clearly set out for that manager what process they need to follow. Um, but importantly, also um, what process the employee can expect. And whether that's informal or formal, um, it's really important for, again, that manager to have that roadmap and the employee who's at the heart of this process to understand what the next steps might be. And this, don't forget, this also links back to deal with issues promptly. Most procedures will make you address issues early on at the informal stage, and sometimes that can get overlooked. So they're just as important to help the manager and the employee understand what might be happening at an informal stage as they are when you move things into onto a more formal footing. Um, a point to note in terms of a tribunal claim is that not following your policy can render a subsequent dismissal procedurally unfair. So we, we do see cases where you might have fair grounds to dismiss someone. Um, and if the procedure had been followed, it would have been a fair dismissal. And that can be really frustrating in the tribunal. Um, it's not unusual for us to see employees who have been taken through a process, say, for example, with a performance issue, without even glancing at the policy that applies and therefore what the employee can expect. Um, and I have had a recent case um, which, which had that kind of issue at its heart, that um, a number of meetings have been held with the employee, um, but they've been given these new names, <laughs> um, none of which were actually reflected within the stages of the policy. Um, so it was really clear that the policy hadn't been looked at and therefore deadlines within the policy hadn't been adhered to either. So um, often issues with policies are about timing, as I've alluded to. So um, th there can be a, a pressure on managers to have to rush through the process. Those policies might set out some deadlines, might set out some expected timescales. They need to be focused on and, and you need to adhere to those. And if you're not going to be able to adhere to a deadline, you need to communicate that to the employee. With the web, the best will in the world, things don't always go to plan. Um, so, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say you need to follow your policies and you need to be aware of, of the deadlines, the timescales, everything within those. Um, but things can go awry. So if they do, don't panic. Um, I don't identify any hiccups and deal with them. It can be a bit embarrassing to think, well, oh no, the procedure's not gone the way that it should have been followed within the process, but it happens. So rather than crack on, it's best to recognise it and address it. See what the issue's been and see if you can rectify it. Communicate with the employee and that will put you in the best position you can be if, if that kind of thing's happened. Um, and I think it's also helpful that managers have some idea of employment law. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, in great depth, but it's really helpful if managers understand why they're going through a process and how that can play out at a tribunal. Um, and that just can be its most basic, but that can really help managers to understand their part within the process. Um, and I think something which I always say to my clients, which can really focus people's minds, is if you have a manager, you've given in the process, you said, this is what you need to be following. Um, it's really helpful to make them make it clear to them that if this were to go to a tribunal, so if you've got a particularly fractious issue you're dealing with, then that manager that's taken this employee through the process, whether that be misconduct performance or whatever, is likely to be our key witness. And I have to say, you know, that really can focus the mind when you make that really clear that that could potentially be, they will have to justify what their decision, but also having gone through this process as well. So the uh, next uh, sort of top tip for you is about investigating complaints promptly. And this is about supporting um, investigators as they carry out an investigation. So obviously with any kind of process that we're going through, uh, an investigation is a really key process, and whether that be performance, disciplinary, grievance, bullying or harassment. 
um, it can get quite messy. It's not a mean feat when you get presented with a grievance, which is 30 to 40 pages long. And you've got to try and work out, you know, that the investigator's got to try and work out what am I supposed to be lo looking at. So the trick with this, the pitfall to avoid is not being prepared enough. It's really, really important to be as prepared as you can, particularly when it's a complex issue. And there's just so much to be done. So I think there is a tendency to dive right in, to meet with the employee and think, right, OK, we need to sort of we need to crack on. We need to meet, meet a resolution. Um, but I find um, that the easiest way of dealing with an investigation and preparing is being clear what you're investigating in the first place. So if it's a grievance, then the ideal situation would be for the investigator to sit down and identify what the different grievances are in that 30 to 40 page document that they're going to look at and then agree that that's what the parameters are going to be of that investigation with the employee. That's going to make it much easier. Um, and what I would suggest um, you do in this kind of situation, even if it's not a more complex grievance is that you have a matrix which is just a table really where you list on one side all the different issues that you're investigating and then next to those particular issues you talk about what document you need to see what evidence do you need to see who do you need to speak to who's the employee said that you need to speak to what document is the employee pointed you to and if you follow that through for each issue that makes it much easier to ensure that you deal with all the issues that are being raised as well um, and then when you come to draft the outcome letter you can easily set out this was the issue this is what i looked at this is who i spoke to and this is my decision and it's based on x y and z it just makes it much easier to follow through a bullet point on this particular slide is about making sure you ID witnesses. Um, all potential witnesses should be interviewed. And right at the very beginning of my career, um, I was sat behind counsel uh, as a newly qualified solicitor um, on a case where um, it was found against our client um, because they simply hadn't invest, they hadn't identified all the witnesses and they hadn't spoken to everybody in the room. For some reason, they'd just spoken to a people it was a classroom situation it was a school and they just spoke to students at the front of the um, classroom and they just didn't speak to anybody at the back um, and therefore that caused them issues in the tribunal and that was an unfair dismissal because a fair investigation hadn't been carried out so um We've alluded on the slide about specific findings of fact should be made for each allegation. Sometimes that sort of quite basic point can be missed when you get to the outcome. So imagine you've moved from your matrix, you've got all your information, you've populated that with everything and you move into your decision now. Um, there needs to be findings made. Um, what you know, If it's a particular misconduct issue, are we making a finding that X happened on X date or not? You know, and, and then the investigator does need to sort of nail their colours to the mast in terms of why they've reached their decision. So it's really important to follow that through. And um, it can be difficult to unpick that then in a tribunal as a witness. And um, so it's really helpful that they will set that out in their outcome letter, but really clear and um, where there's cases of conflict, for example, and it's not straightforward, and um, why they believe somebody. Why am I taking someone else's evidence or what they say over and above what someone else is saying? Um, and also irrelevant evidence, including past disciplinary record, very important, um, should simply not be included. So uh, we've got some uh, clocks there talking about delay, basically. So delay can really cause an issue with, with the tribunal. Um, and it's just not uncommon to see grievances, for example, that you know haven't been investigated for like 12 months because we're still trying to get the panel together or we're still trying to work out what we need to do so that it's just a slide to just remind you really just move things forward as quickly as you can when clients say to me how long should an average grievance take to investigate why is it taking more than two weeks you know and um, so i know that can be a short time scale if it's a big issue but it's something to definitely think about and again, a reminder about collecting evidence. So it's really important to keep that paper trail, as Becky's alluded to there. Um, and we've got some um, examples on that slide for you to have a look at about just making sure that you just record as much as you possibly can. Protected characteristics. So this is uh, the last sort of top tip, really. Um, it's in, all about training, really, and managers understanding when discrimination 
can arise. Recruitment is the obvious stage where this can happen. So it's really important that decisions made at the recruitment stage are objectively evidenced. Um, documents need to be kept, uh, notes need to be kept just in case you need to defend your position. Unconscious bias is a big issue as well, particularly in recruitment. So why are we clicking with a particular candidate more than another? candidate is it because we have a same shared experience and shared characteristics so um with that kind of issue unconscious bias training is something that we would definitely um recommend um and i think when there's concerns are raised as becky's alluded to relating to a protected characteristic um you need to make sure people get the opportunity to be heard direct them to the right procedure and it's helpful if uh, managers have had training to understand how to deal with issues when someone's raising an issue or a concern specifically about a protected characteristic. So I'm now going to move on to Becky, who's going to talk to you about resolution. Thank you, Pilly. Um, so what do you do if, if a problem arises and the employee isn't satisfied with how things progressed internally and um, perhaps they're threatening a claim or if you've got an employee who's causing difficulties and you want to resolve those issues you might want to get rid of the risk of an ET claim you might want to try and exit the individuals from from an organization so so what are your options for for doing that well the, the first thing I would say is that you need to understand your risk before you um, before you decide what you're going to do about it um, so first thing to consider is is kind of does the employee have a point is there a is there merit to the individual's um allegations or sense of disgruntlement um and and what would your um prospects be of successfully defending that claim and we usually try and put a, a kind of percentage chance on on that which which is um quite helpful i think um, so have a think about the risks and, and those risks can take all sorts of, of different forms. So there's there's financial risk. Um, so you might be thinking about potential compensation that somebody might get, um, potential legal costs. Um, but then there might also be other issues, other other risk factors such as, as reputation. So how is this going to affect the charity's um, reputation? Is it setting a precedent for, for other employees and is, is that going to cause a problem so have a think about what's in the in the charity's best interests i also think when you're thinking about resolution and and what your options are and so on it's important to understand the employee's motivation um, and if you can understand that at the outset it often helps to to reach an agreed position earlier um, because you know if somebody is is um kind of all about the, the compensation and so on, then that's something that you need to look at. If it's about an apology or whatever it might be, then then that might be something that you look at. So certainly have a think about what their motivation is for, for threatening the claim or for, for raising the allegations or whatever it might be. Um, and I always, this isn't something that I, I put on the slide, but it is something that I always say to charities that when anybody comes to me with a dispute and that that is where do you want to end up? What's your what's your goal in this? Do you want to exit this person? Do you want to sort out the relationships? So what are your think about what your kind of prioritized outcomes are and, and then work backwards from there. So um, in terms of how you go about resolving it, so um, there, are, there are different um, avenues you can take. So protected conversations is, is, a, is a legal term. So you can have a protected conversation with somebody um, whereby you won't have to disclose the detail of the conversation or any um, related correspondence if, a, if an unfair dismissal claim is brought. Um, the only thing to bear in mind with that is that where there is a risk of a discrimination claim, um, so you, you can't use a, a protected conversation of a of a means of um, it, it won't be protected from disclosure, if you like, um, the conversation won't be protected from disclosure in terms of a discrimination claim. So it is just just usable for those unfair dismissal claims. Um, you can utilize ACAS, who um, 
obviously offer a conciliation service so they can kind of mediate negotiate between the parties and sometimes it's really helpful to get them involved because it's all very well you saying well you're not going to get this in tribunal or we can't do this that or the other but actually they don't believe it till they hear it from somebody who's a perhaps impartial um so um their their input can very much introduce a um a reality and a, and a setting of expectations um, you can have what we call without prejudice discussions um they're, they're discussions in a genuine attempt to resolve an existing dispute um, that that does mean um that that they can't then be shared with the tribunal if if there is a if there is a claim but you do need to make sure that there is actually a dispute in existence at at, at that point. Um, and then we can also look at mediation. Um, so that's where a, a third party comes in and helps facilitate a conversation between you and um, the employee to try and get things resolved. And that can really be useful where there's an ongoing relationship with the with the employee or, or indeed excuse me, where that individual, um, there are relationship issues, you know, for, for those sorts of things, it can be, it can be really useful. Okay, and then what do you do if you end up where there is a claim or you think a claim is, is coming down the line and you, you need to prepare for it? Um, so from, um, I think it's, it's worth saying, and it sounds a bit pessimistic, um, but if there's a dispute, then try and work on the basis that it will result in a claim. Um, and if you do that, then um, you, you'll perhaps be more careful about how you proceed and, and protect the charities position so always think how will this look to a judge that's my that's my um little mantra should i send this because because if it got in front of a judge what would what would they think of it um it might sound obvious but don't make things worse for yourself um so we come across problems where evidence hasn't been preserved so you'll have held on probably to the to the key hr documents and those sorts of things but quite often there's correspondence or you know email traffic between the employee and other people that actually should be kept and and isn't um on the flip side of that, don't create unnecessary evidence. So anything that's created uh, that is a document that's in existence at the time of the tribunal hearing, if it's relevant, it will be disclosable unless it's privileged by virtue of kind of having come from us or being in discussion with your legal advisors and, and so on. Um, so, so just be careful about creating things that subsequently might be damaging. And um the, the you know the the another um, element related to that is, is making sure that you're aware of what is and what isn't privileged. Um, so without prejudice, correspondence doesn't have to be disclosed. Correspondence with your legal advisors doesn't have to be disclosed. Um, but things internally, even if it's with, with your HR team, they are usually relevant and usually disclosable. So make sure that you, you bear that in mind. Um, decide who will be the um, point of contact if a claim is submitted. That might sound really funny, but um, quite often we have claims that go astray um, and it's it's useful for, for, for there to be a kind of designated person. Um, and then um, make sure that you take legal advice early on. You know, we, we can vote. We've seen all these things before. Um, very often we can, um, you know, give you a set of steps and a strategy that will prevent put you know really put you in the best position for um defending a claim all right so i think that's that's all that we were going to say there ha there haven't been any um questions thus far in the in the um question and answer box i misspoke earlier and said you should put them in the chat i should have said you put them in the question and answer box but it doesn't look like there are any um, from you. So Pilly, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to that last slide where all our details are, thank you. So um, if any of you do have any questions after the session, then um, mine and Pilly's um, informa contact information is there. You're welcome to connect with us on LinkedIn and um, follow the QR code and, and so on. But um, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>